Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is John Spencer. I will tell you all about John in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is the show that focuses on what's too often called the soft stuff, the carrying the commitment, the courage we exert for others. And when you do it uh, as a leader, as you will very much discover that John Spencer is, you do it with the singular purpose of bringing people together. Welcome to Grace Under Pressure, John Spencer. So, Thank you, John. It's an great. honor to be here. Great. I want to tell folks all about you. John Spencer is the chair of Urban Warfare Studies at the United States Military Academy. He's the author of a brand new book, just came out this past June, called Connected Soldiers, Life, Leadership, and Social Connections in Modern Warfare. The book has been endorsed highly uh, by Generals Petraeus, McChrystal, and McMaster. How's that <laughs> for uh, sending a book out uh, on release? Congratulations. Uh, John serves also as uh, attached to the California State Guard and with the 4th Army, in excuse me, 4th Infantry Division, California Army National Guard. But his, also his main job, as he told me, is at West Point. He is a, a veteran and highly decorated. Uh, John Spencer, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. So, Thank you, John. Thanks, thanks okay. for that. Great. You focus on connected soldiers. I believe it's rooted in the concept of cohesion. That is a watchword of the military. What does it mean, basically? Yeah, I agree. It's a watchword. And sometimes people use it for other terms. But cohesion is literally like, like a definition of glue and cohesion. Uh, it's the bonds between individuals of a group where they bond themselves to each other and they bond themselves to the group as a part of their identity. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's not only a watchword, it's, it's, I think it's the glue of the military. Yeah, now you have modified the term or added to it, called it primary group cohesion. What is the distinction, John? So yeah, so you can have, so that's not my word, that's, that's a you know military studies word, but you can have you can cohesion. For most of our audience <laughs> is civilians, so that's okay. So, uh, so primary group cohesion, uh, is a primary group is your immediate group where you have face-to-face -face relationships and interpersonal relationships with that group. Because you can have a cohesive company or organization that you know, is proud to work for the organization, identifies with the group, but your primary group is that immediate team that you work with every day face-to-face -face and have an interpersonal relationship with. Okay, great. Now, um, <clears throat> connected soldiers. What prompted you to use the word connected um, in the title? So, uh, well, well, probably because Band of Brothers was already used. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the book, uh, I, think, I think you might have to take that up with uh, William Shakespeare <laughs> first. But that's right. Of course, that's right. Uh, Stephen Amber, uh, Stephen Ambrose, yes. So, uh, and, and Tom Hanks might have a few things to say about it. But uh, uh, so connections, I think, are so important to humans and to the military. So that's the theme of the book is how these connections are so vital to our, our lives, our work, um, and, and for the military for surviving war, those connections. So it, it, it does actually become greater than the actual title. I actually signed a book, Stay Connected to What Matters Most. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know you can relate to that as, you know, Assigning priorities in life and in leadership and in companies and everything is important. Okay, great. The connectedness, yes. I think it's fundamental to community. Now, um, as a civilian, um, intellectually, I could describe combat. I've seen it on television, of course. Um, but I know absolutely nothing of it because I have not experienced it. So what about what does a shared combat experience do for those in it, the, the soldiers, the women and men in the unit? So... Yeah. yeah, so it, it, it does a lot. Um, going to war, you know, war is the worst human experience in history. It is hell by definition. But when, when a group of soldiers uh, go to war together, it bonds them in those shared hardships of adversity and, and, in, and in, in successes. But it creates a lifelong and literally lifelong bond with those individuals because you relied on them for your survival and they relied on you. And that level of, of pure trust and commitment it is hard to replicate in the civilian world. Sure. So soldiers who experience that take it with, it becomes a part of their identity. And those become lifelong friends. 
Yeah, and, and, right. And I want to explore this now. Just to, superficially, we, if uh, as a civilian, and I think most people who are in my straits, I did not wear the uniform. If I think of combat, my first instinct is, man, I can't wait to get home. It's not true. Am I on to something there? I think you write about that. So. Yeah, hundred percent. And others have written about it that I don't miss. I don't miss war, but we all miss war as in the experience of creating that type of love for another individual and to have, to be a part of something greater than yourself where they rely on you before their lives, that, that purity of tribe and community, it gets brought to the very heightened level of senses in war, but it's, it's actually a human need. Uh, and I think that's what the, the lesson of war that veterans can tell civilians is that that level of community and connections is a part of human flourishing and of highly effective teams. And that's why there's always a relationship between the military and business and, and sports. Right. Now, there's a, a, a flip side of that, of course. And Elliot Ackerman wrote about, <clears throat> um, it's a concept I've heard, you, you're never so alive as you are in this kind of combat. Which so, uh, And then when you come home, there's this period of decompression and you don't you lose that connectedness. And that can cause difficulties in readjustment. Am I correct, John? So. Yeah, ab absolutely. And a lot of veterans struggle with that. One, they struggle with be just serving in a for something greater than themselves. Um, they they miss that identity as being a team member in a in a team that values that it values you mm -hmm. as a nation that values your role, your profession. Um, so there's lots that soldiers struggle with when they get disconnected from that because it, it almost makes you challenge your own identity like who am i what role do i serve in my community which is people soldiers just have to get realigned to there's there's life after military service and, and that's a huge part of it yeah and and, and exploring this a little bit um you know i had phil cly whom you know well phil is a noted author <clears throat> both fiction and nonfiction, and also uh, Marine veteran. And he talked about, and people stopped him in conversation as something he said is that they were struggling, con civilians struggling to connect with be the father or uh, a spouse or whatever. And John said his advice, or excuse me, Phil's advice was ask them about something good that happened. Don't ask, don't revert to the negative. Does that, does that ring true to you, John? So, yeah, I think so. I think it's, to me, it goes back to human nature. Ask them their story, and that's what I've usually heard. Is you know, don't thank a veteran for his service. You know, ask them about something they experienced, and it's usually going to be the story they want to tell about some great act of selfless service, some great act of serving in this unit during this time. But these stories are are so important to all of us, not just veterans. So it's interesting if even if you talk to an older person, like you know, tell me what it was like to to be a, in, in, in the great depression or, or something like that. Um, yeah. Storytelling is human nature. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you touched on story because that is vital to the human um, response. And when we talk about leadership, I always think about uh, it goes back to our ancestral times of telling stories. And uh, it's, it's a way of you know, illustration, of course, of what, you know, what to do, what not to do and lessons learned <laughs> or not learned. <laughs> so, and, and that's powerful. So what is it that um, you know, this idea of connecting to this, because I know your book is broader than just the experience of the military. So what do you, what can we learn? We as civilians learn from this concept of cohesion and connectedness, John. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot in there. And I know you appreciate it even more than I could explain about the most effective teams in any organization are ones that identify with the group and have a shared understanding of what the goal is this is this is not new stuff and you write about it a lot in your so the military exposes that since they have to have social cohesion in order to survive and there's a difference between social cohesion and task cohesion but really as a civilian or a business leader is that understanding that you're leading humans and that humans value identity like who they are and connections as a community tribe we have these different names for it but it can mm -hmm. literally mean just team, 
Um, right. and, and as I dug into my memoir and my book, it, it just kept coming back up to, this is about building a team, shared, right. shared hardships and all that stuff. I think a an, an bedrock of that is, of course, a sense of purpose. And I think that the sense of purpose is so palpable within the military. I mean, I sense it even as an observer, outside observer. But and it's something we in the civilian sector and corporate or even nonprofit or the organizational struggle with purpose. We impose it. So what mistakes do you or what advice would you have to say, uh, a middle manager or uh, trying to drive purpose. What, so what, how could you help your, yeah. your teaching? Yeah, absolutely. And this is what I try to explain in the book through stories of, of, of real adversity when the purpose was, was lost. Yeah. I think leaders are communicators. In, at all echelons, middle management, even the base management, it is their duty to communicate the purpose. The, we, you know, you know, some people say start with why. In the military, we don't go, we don't start a day, especially in war, without telling the soldiers what to do and why they're doing it. Because if you empower them, you get that 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 cohesion, but you also get that understanding they could get there in a different way, but they understand why they're doing it. Um, and that purpose is is multi echelon. But leaders are communicators, and it's the role of that middle communicator. If he doesn't understand, he better be asking he or she asking the the next level up like why um so that they can provide that purpose which is i think a bedrock of what people want well something i learned from the military when you hear the communication of course is the concept and i've used it in my coaching as the brief back what role does that play for you as a command as an officer or uh speaking to your the those that report to you in your squad whatever yeah, it, it, it's a it's another. So all cultures have daily practices which empower them, um, and that's one of the powers of the military is that daily practice of not only issuing out a daily task and purpose we call it, um, but the the subordinate brief back is and okay now explain to me what I just said to you, so that we can mesh as a team and have this shared understanding. Right, really, people don't understand how hard it is to get shared understanding even within a small team of. 50 to below 50 personnel. I mean, the really great way for a leader to check that is just explain to me what I just either said or what our company values are or whatever. It, it is a powerful communication technique. Now, I want to drill down on purpose for a second here for uh, and your experience. I can understand when a soldier uh, and uh, and you have and we're going to touch on this. You have uh, been to Ukraine, actually, and studied it and researched it. So the big why is known. Is there such a thing as the little purpose, i.e. what we do today? How does that add up, John? Yeah, absolutely. And this is the connections, right? In allowing somebody to mentally connect their small task to a much broader and then much broader and then much broader of why they're even standing there in that moment. And I faced this in war, even in a challenging war with um misconceptions about why you're there but it starts at the lowest level and you connect them and we actually have a, a communication technique too where we brief two levels up because it will change at different levels mm -hmm. uh, and we brief two levels up of okay this is why the higher organization is doing these things and this is our small piece of that pie i think that that level of purpose allows for people so when i traveled to ukraine recently to to study the battle of kiev i could see in every individual from from kids to grandparents that they understood why they were, were fighting. They, they, they were fighting for their way of life. And now that's extremely powerful when everybody has that shared identity and understanding. Right. So, so what are you, how well trained are they? I mean, they have a, they had a military or have an army or military. What's it's now it's primarily civilian or am I, it, Educate me, John. Sure. So um, it, now it's it, the war has changed. So on February 24th, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it was um, it was literally like a Red Dawn scenario where a very small military, the second most powerful military invaded Ukraine. And they were outnumbered 10 to 1 by any measure. But there are there's also 40 million civilians. And so the civilians rose up in places like Kiev where 10,000 civilians now armed with weapons rose up 
and fought, but you're right. They didn't, they had no training, um, but they had the, they had that purpose and that will mm -hmm. to fight. They were motivated, right? All these things that you, you talk to us about, yeah. about th that inspiration in leadership, the, the messages coming from the president. But what I discovered in, in really another lesson that I learned in the military, which I had a small role in UK is I, I started putting out very clear instructions. If I was in a city fighting against a superior military, like, um, and that's what people under stress or even people that are confused need clarity of instructions. So communicating clearly. And I even did it with diagrams. And then I, I had I played a small role in helping the civilians. You don't want to see civilians fighting in the war, right? It's just yeah. really bad. Now the war, that war was won. And now the war in Ukraine is, is, is in the east. And it's really strictly military. But there's still um, cities that are occupied right. where civilians are fighting. Right. One of the things that I've heard of the strength of the U.S. military and perhaps other Western powers is um, the uh, uh, commanders on the ground. I mean, from non-commissioned non officers, very strong r through that rank. Uh, from what I have heard from uh, military analysts is that uh, the Russians don't have that. So they lack that unit cohesion. Has that been your experience, John? So Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, it's hard to put a, a, a moniker on an entire organization because just like every organization, there's a bell curve of excellence versus that mm -hmm. team needs more work. But yes, the Russian system re requires conscripts and it doesn't have that middle management, those career personnel that know everything about the organization. They, they've seen, in this case, they've seen war the U.S. military and Western militaries have that as the, we call it our backbone, that middle management, those non-commissioned officers who, tying back to what we just said, who then can understand the why and they'll get it done. If you don't have that, 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 that structure in your organization, then when adversity comes, it just all starts to fall apart because there's no, there's no leader saying, okay, this is what you need to do. Um, and somebody's looking up, looking for instructions. A powerful right. organization will get it done. I'm glad you used the term middle management. I guess I, I did a book, I think it was uh, when I called Lead with Purpose. I talked about the myth of hierarchy, which is the boss at the top, the CEO says, let's do this and it's automatically done. <laughs> so I, when I used to teach that class and workshop, I would have a the little exercise called the, grant, grant, the <laughs> Green Pants Day, where the CEO decided Everybody on Tuesday had to wear green pants. And that was the exercise. And people would say, well, what are these things? And I go, just take it. You're the, you're the uh, VP of X, and you have to make sure everybody <laughs> wears green pants. And so that's kind of, uh, I was obviously spoofing the whole idea of orders from on high, but nothing happened. But they do, everybody does wear green pants because middle managers figure out, okay, let's do it and give it reasons. So I think that's, that's a valuable lesson. Would you say that John. yeah 100 percent. and it's in that hierarchical model that might be the opposite of where somebody tells everybody what to do and there's a there's a level where somebody's telling it is a weak system it may work mm -hmm. on some cases it won't it won't work all the time but it's yeah. it's a strong weak and a more powerful model is a model where you have that we call it disciplined initiative right when you've given them a high the purpose and now they can get it done with ways you never even thought about Great. Now, getting back to your book, which is part memoir and stuff, and you said that you served in Iraq in 2003 and you served again in 2008. What had changed? What did what was the, the circumstance for you that you observed? So just so it was a different war with a different military. But the biggest change that I saw and what I write about in the book is that in 2003, we went off to war like I, I had saw in movies and read in books disconnected from our homes, writing letters. I mean, in 2008, the world has changed and, and internet and telecommunications meant that soldiers and, and even I could talk to home every day by email, by social media, by text. And that was changing the experience of the work, the mission, the war 
it was changing it on a daily basis. And that was what I was observing in 2008. Well, how, how was it changing it? I mean, what, I mean, it sounds pretty cool to me to be able to stay in touch with home, but I think you were saying there's a downside to that. Am I correct, John? Yeah, so. yeah absolutely. So this process of building cohesion in teams, team building, there's lots that we've learned in the history of man on how to do that, right? Create team building exercises, uh, spend time together, eat together, sleep together live for us in the military well that that is about building social bonds getting to know each other well the one of the issues with immediate connections to an outside organization right outside of your primary group is that you look to others for your social support so i was recognizing that the constant communication was actually you were lessening the time that soldiers were talking to each other even after a trauma which is very important because you in war, there is traumatic incidents, yeah. uh, and you have to talk about those. And there, there's practices that you can do in order, like after actions, reviews, debriefs, things like that, that can help that process of understanding how to get better, understanding what just happened. The connections were were complicating that because they were unmanaged. In my situation, the leadership was was absent, so it was just going unmanaged. So what was, so did you tell soldiers <laughs> don't call home, don't text or what, what, what no, did you I, have to handle that? <laughs> no, I, I, and I would never do that. And that's, that's yeah. a myth that somebody thinks is going to control this new world right. we live in, right? The world changes. And so do we, um, I recognize that there were, the soldiers weren't doing some of the natural bonding experiences and put in steps like the fact that soldiers would eat together after a patrol or that they would talk to each other after a hard mission. Those are easy leadership kind of course corrections that could be made. But I also had to understand that the challenges, you know, I think it was Colin Powell said, if soldiers aren't bringing you, you their problems, then you're not leading anymore. So having that connection, with the, having that connection with the home front meant that soldiers would have a foot in both worlds. Soldiers would be at war, but also they would be present at home fathers, husbands. So that meant that they were going to be dealing with mentally, you know, a complex set of problems, just like we do in the, in, in the regular work life. Yeah. Um, the leadership has to understand that soldier's problems. And that's the examples I provide in a book, even an example of a soldier whose girlfriend pregnant was overdosing on drugs, which meant he, he wasn't going to be able to function that day in combat. So I had to make a decision as a leader going, okay, you stay back after my middle management recommended, like, sir, you can't take this person out. And that's just the reality of the world. But it's, it gets back to, you know, the leadership principles that you talked about. We're leading human. If you don't know your immediate coworkers, you won't be able to help. Uh, and that's that, that idea of you caring about them that I know you talk about is so important to be a leader. Right. And there's something that happens in the military and it happens at sports together. And I always like the example of uh, and it's the word love. Um, and I've heard that from the veteran. Every veteran I've had on the show uses that word at times. And so it always strikes me as you're in a combat situation. And you talk about love. So what does that love that plays the vital role in unit cohesion? Am I correct, John? Absolutely. It's we call it um, that's that bond. It's not friendship. It's, it's beyond friendship. It's love where you're willing to lay down your life for the group and for that person who is a member of the group because it's it's vital to your survival, but you also, they are etched into you once you experience some of those relationships together. In the military, we I refer to people that I love as brothers. Um, and it's, I've found that it, I grew up in the military, right? I just 25 years that it wasn't shared in, in other organizations that, I call a friend a brother, and I mean that. He, they're a part of my family, and that means I would sacrifice for them. It, it's that element of love for each other that is human. No, that's so powerful. So we as civilians, we're probably not going <laughs> to throw that word around a manager. I mean, he might ingest or she might say, I love you guys. But, you know, there are teams which there is a high performance team and they've worked together and there is a bond of friendship and I'll call it love, whatever. But I, I think you said something, you said it several times, and it's getting to know the humanity of your people. That doesn't mean you need to be buddy, buddy. We're talking in the civilian sector, but you need to be there for them. 
Is yeah, that correct? John? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's called leadership, not friendship. So <laughs> I like that. It's called uh, leadership, not friendship. Good. Yeah. Um, because, but uh, like the, a genuine leader cares about the individuals and then that allows them to be an inspirational leader. I actually talk about it in my book. Even people believe that in the military, that it's very hierarchical and I give out orders because I'm in a power, I'm in a position above you. That's the, again, again, another weakness and a misconception. The, the best part of leading individuals is once they understand that I care about them and I know they care about me, then I can lead through inspiring them by example, all of this. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's not friendship, but leadership, but that yeah. doesn't mean you, you don't get to know them. You have to know them. You can't lead people without knowing because each right. individual may have a different need, a different communication style, a, a different leadership style. And that's a higher level. I know, John, that you talk about a lot. Yeah. Well, one of our longtime listeners who told me today, Joe, uh, has a son in the military and he's loving this episode. So thank you. But he said, ask John about trust. And I think that you just nailed it right there. It's that caring. Am I, am I correct? So Absolutely. Trust. And, and we say in the military, trust is earned. Uh and, and once you lose it, it's, it's never, it's closely linked to integrity, but I have to trust that a person in the group identifies with the group. And there's actually a lot of history in wars where individuals will be cast out of the group in the worst case scenario because nobody trusts them anymore to, to put the group above themselves or to even be a functioning member of the team. But yeah, we say trust is the bedrock of, of our military and it, it is. Um, but you have to put that in realistic terms. What does that mean? Um, and that it can combine with the caring about people is they'll learn to trust that you will put their needs at least in a priority list on top of every consideration. Um, it it okay. becomes, this is, you know, this is all common sense to you, John, I know, but it's, it's about <laughs> leading humans and we as humans have to trust our leaders in order to follow them. Well, I don't know if it's common sense to me, but it's uh, but and, and I'm glad you keep talking about using the word human a lot because we so often um, we live in the cognitive realm in our heads and we we think we think we think, which is good. But I think we overthink and forget the well, I will say the physicality, but that is our humanness. That is our emotional quotient. That is how we're feeling, how we're connecting. And when you're in a, a unit and you're all together, social together all the time, it's even more uh, imperative to recognize the humanity of one another. So, yeah. And this is, I think this is my book. Came, I wrote, I finished my book before COVID. Um, but this is what COVID taught us is that we have human needs is connections you need social support you need identity purpose you need all these things to actually live like it, it it turns out to depression and negative physical reactions to that lack of connections and that can be in the workplace on sports and in definitely in the military well, we so we have certainly been through COVID, and one of the problems, especially with young people, um, is social isolation, um, and that is a real issue. Um, and so, I, I use the word um, um, that w what we try to look at the workplace as a kind of community, and uh, that's fundamental to uh, uh, the military is a community. So, um, and, we all need community. It's like yeah. literally a part of human nature. And I think the, and you have said this too, but being part of a community doesn't mean everybody thinks alike or gets along totally, but they have a unified purpose. Am I correct? So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, if depending on teams, a shared understanding of what their goals are. Right. Well, John, we are racing through this time together. And, you know, I ask everybody for a story, every guest, a story on grace. Do you have one that you would like to share with us? So. Sure. And it's it was one of the hardest leadership decisions I made in my military career. And it's in the book where um, one of my subordinate leaders, a, an officer, had an accidental discharge of his weapon into a clearing. It's a very dangerous phenomenon. Um, but my orders from above was report such an incident immediately. Um, and, and that person would, would you know, possibly be fired and things like that. I had to make a personal decision on whether I would do that. I made a decision not to report it. So I disobeyed an order, but then had I struggled with the leader bringing the team together and let them understand that 
I was putting my skin in the game as our as our our group needed to to deal with this internally so that we could continue to move forward and improve in our situation because we were in a bad place. So I think that showed selfless service for my team. And it was a real hard decision for me to make because I was putting myself personally in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. But I, I've learned that of course the entire organization recognized that I was leading with empathy and grace that I was willing to sacrifice myself for the team. And that's a visible action. Subordinates will care about what you do, not necessarily what you say. Absolutely. Well, by showing them grace, you gave them an opportunity to continue and grow and develop together. And that's a form of grace in itself. So thank you. Um, John, how can people find you and the book, Connected Soldiers? So. Sure. So I'm on uh, johnspencerconline.com or on Twitter at Spencer Guard. The book's available on Amazon. It's pretty easy to find. Just Google that Connected Soldiers. Great. Well, we will put that in the notes. Uh, John Spencer, it has been a privilege to have you on the show today. Thanks for spending time. And with that, we're out.